first of the yeah, that's recorded. Yeah, go ahead and start. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight, and uh, welcome to the users group, to the Utah Hadoop users group. This is part of the Big Data Utah users group and uh, Utah Geek events. Uh, we're kind of getting a full house to so make sure that we squeeze in and kind of get nice and friendly with each other. There are a couple other chairs that hopefully Mohan and Osikana don't mind if we kind of pull in as we go. But thank you very much for being here tonight, for making sure to take care of us on pizza and everything else, right? So let's give them a round of applause. For thank you. So tonight we have a great presentation from Yugen Ku from OC or from sorry from Overstock, almost the same place. But anyway, um, sorry to have a little bit of a late start. Start normally we start late, but because this is a technical users group, we have technical difficulties every time. Um, I don't think that's how that's supposed to work. Either way, uh, it's almost seven o'clock. I won't take too much time, but briefly I want to mention that there is a Spark Day. On Saturday, please come out to that. We'll have multiple people speaking. We should get you game to come out and speak again. Uh, we've got uh, you know three, four, five speakers. Uh, it should be about a half day present or a half day of presentations. Um, there'll be some cool things there that you can kind of play around with as well. Uh, food, etc. That will be at IHC in Murray. It's a little bit easier to find. <laughs> It is the Dottie Edu Education Center, uh, which is the building on the northeast or northwest side of the IHC buildings. Right? right now, we have the global data competition going on. Um, there are 22 different regions around the world participating. We have, I think, over, uh, well, there's a lot of people participating now. Um, and in those all those different regions, I think we have like 17, 18 different regions with at least one, two, ten people competing. So it's getting bigger. Uh, there is code available so that you can actually go in and practice a little bit. There's training courses that are getting put up on our YouTube channel, multiple other things to help you get started with big data, data science, or to show off your chops if you're really good already. Uh, there will be submissions available, everything else. Phase one, and this is kind of where I'll end, uh, is on, um, so it's a global data competition on climate change, but this is on Mars. I don't know how that happened. Anyway, um, it's on Mars volcanoes. It's a binary image classification problem, and we are ranking you on an AUC score. So basically, if you're at a guess, you're at a 0.5. If you get it to 100% right, you're at 1. If you are basically throwing out a bunch of crap, you're going to score less than 0.5, maybe all the way down to 0. Um, we will then rank it on a bell curve for each of the regions. And the person or people who are at the very top, whether they're a team or an individual, will be able to be eligible for up to 900 points. Then we'll have another phase that's worth 1,700 points, test your skills in data science. So very cool stuff. Get out there, get involved. Even if you're brand, brand new, check it out. It may teach you something that may be extremely valuable that you can turn around into a great career. Again, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, our goal in the long run is to help Utah become the big data hub for the world. All of you coming today helps that happen. So thank you and thank you, you gang, for coming out tonight. Let's, well, let's take one more quick minute. It's here. Um, uh, two things. One, Spark Day is up on Meetup. It's meetup.com. It's on the same page that you registered for this. You'll see it on Saturday, the 18th. It's only noon to four, four or five. Um, what, what did I say? Four or five. Um, and then also, let's just do introductions really quick. I know we're already recording, so everybody's going to get to hear the wonderful introductions. But with a big group of a lot of new people, I'd love to do introductions really quick. So let's go around the room really fast. You've got like one minute to say something really quickly. I think that's probably too low. 25 seconds. But 25 seconds. I've got 10 seconds. Archie King, I'm a database administrator. Okay. Okay. Christian Hargraves. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So speak to you. Earl Cahill. Work from. Okay. 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 I'm doing some research about uh, metaanalytical classification. Okay. Ricardo uh, Pozo, Okay. Greg Smith and Stevens. Okay. Got uh, JP, I really Okay. 
Paul Alexander. TJ Bill, Imagine Learning. Matt White, Transition. Okay. Alex Michael, you saw the health sciences. Okay. Uh, Dave Moffat, uh, Utah Workforce Services. Shane Hudson, WGU. Christina Bailey, Overstock Business Intelligence Department. Okay. Brett Palmer, Software Architect, Consulting with the State of Utah. Okay. Uh, Lalindra, I'm a PhD student. Okay. Olga Patterson, a researcher at the VA. Uh, Matt Free, data scientist at Veris Health. Peter, my son. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. And Seba, I'm Veris Health, uh, credit guy. Okay. I'm Mukun, PhD student. Okay, let's go back here, Shane Chandler. Jared Peterson. Okay. Kelly Pear, a corporation service company for sexuality. Okay. Tracy Falls, the corporation service company. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Heading James Alshus, I'm a software engineer. Right in the back. John Dermott, uh, Coke Serials. Okay. In front again. Bupendra, software engineer, IT. Okay. Right in the front. Joseph Jackson. Okay. Ron, the Quan. Okay. All right. 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 Tom Ginter, University of Utah, Bioinformatics. Hey, everybody, round of applause for doing that. Yeah, yeah, no, not a chance. Now, everybody didn't get a chance to obviously say a lot about themselves, but make sure after the um, session, you definitely talk to each other and communicate. That's really a great part of the user group. So, thank you. All right, thanks. Hi, guys. My name is Yu Gang Yu. I'm a principal scientist at Overstuff.com. Actually, my background is mainly in IT. So, uh, like three, four years ago, I was the lead software developer, basically managing a bunch of software engineers, things like that. But, can you guys hear me? Well, okay. Okay, good. So, uh, I start getting to these data scientists who mainly because I did. Uh, recommendation system three four years ago so yeah I'm, so i'm doing a lot of uh, big data related stuff uh basically doing research in these areas so that's one reason i look into a spark okay enough about myself uh i'm pretty sure probably everyone knows what's the definition of uh, data mining. For Wikipedia, data mining is the computational process of discovering patterns in large data set involving methods at the intersection of artificial intelligence, machine learning, stats, and database systems. And since we're going to talk about data mining, we have to talk about machine learning as well because we're using a bunch of machine learning algorithms to, to do uh, data mining. So machine learning is a scientific display that explores construction and study of algorithms. It's also from Wikipedia. Okay. Since we are in Overstock is in retail domain, so I'm going to cover that one a little bit more. So general user cases in retail, like forecasting, sales, things like that. And email targeting, and geo-targeting, and retargeting customers with coupon ads, things like that. And personalized contents. So uh, as I mentioned before, I did uh, like recommendation stuff, it's kind of in this domain. Personalize the content and shows recommendations to customers. Yeah, recommendation assistance. Product bundling, that's another case. So when someone buys something, we want to see if there's uh, any opportunities for someone else to buy more stuff, right? And customer segmentation. 
because we want to uh, target a specific group of customers. And prices <coughs> based on customer behavior, passion. So those are some of these use cases in retail domain. And there are some existing tools out there, but today I'm going to talk about Spark more. So uh, the first one, everyone probably knows uh, quite a bit, you know. And another thing in, in that domain I feel kind of exciting is the H2O from Hex Data. So uh, they have uh, quite a bit of algorithms. They develop, develop quite a bit of algorithms in that domain already. And another thing, other uh, machine, le machine learning packages haven't done much is the deep learning. And they do have that one in there as well. But I'm going to talk a lot more uh, on a later slide on the machine learning packages, what kind of machine learning tools we can use, things like that. Python, that's another option, right? Everyone knows Python. That's kind of pretty popular tool as well. And second, um, things like that. And currently, we're doing a lot of Hadoop method use. In Overstock, we're using that one quite a bit still. But hopefully, we can move to a Spark for all these algorithms we developed during the last three years. So one thing we are still using is the pig. Everyone knows pig? OK. Pig, basically, you can write uh, it's kind of a procedure language. You can write that one, then uh, it will interpret that into, basically, it will compare that into a multiple map reduce jobs. That's why I put this one in this category. That makes sense to you guys? So Hive is another another example. Hive is do the same thing, but you can write SQL. Then underneath, it's creating a bunch of memory use jobs. Okay. The reason oh, let's cover another one first. Cascading. How many people know cascading? Oh, cool. So cascading is a Java framework. Basically, uh, you can write MapReduce jobs using that cascading library. Okay, it's kind of pretty neat because you can do uh, reusability. is pretty good once you do uh, cascading, and there are some multiple flavors of uh, cascading built on top of it: cascalog, scouting, things like that. You know, so. Uh, and there's some commercial software available as well. SAS, Aster, you know. But today we're going to look at just Spark, mainly Spark. Okay. So why Spark? Because it's uh, very fast. It's an open source cluster computing framework. And that support the memory cluster computing, uh, faster test, test setup. The main reason I think why MapReduce is so slow is that uh, there are a couple reasons. One reason is that uh, for every MapReduce stage, basically you need to read data from somewhere, HDFS, then save back to HDFS, then set up that the whole thing again. So, and Spark, Spark is, you know, with the Spark, you know, uh, no longer you need to do that anymore. Okay, RDD it's a resilient distributed data set. That's the main concept in Spark, and make it fast. And mm -hmm. Spark also support uh, streaming. So, you know, MapReduce typically is a batch processing, right? Before we have a Spark, typically we have we need to go to a store for real time processing. But Spark can support both. That's kind of nice. 
So it's already really developed by uh, UC Berkeley. And now it's a Apache project, top level project. And it's written in Scala, but it supports multiple uh, languages as well. So it supports Java, Scala, Python, R as well. In, in Spark uh, 1.3, I believe, with the Spark R. Okay. It's kind of nice for data samples. If they already write lots of R code, then you can still use it. Okay, why Spark? It's a fast, as I mentioned. It supports multiple flavors, support external in memory databases. So, uh, Tachyon, that's a pretty good project. Uh, basically, it's a memory centric distributed uh, storage system. It's kind of like HDFS, but it's in memory. So, uh, now these days, lots of people are passionate about uh, Tachyon now. And they create a commercial company behind it now. Uh, it's called uh, Tachyon Nexus. They just got uh, uh, like 7.5 million funding this year. So that's kind of nice. As I mentioned, it support both batch and real time processing. Okay. And fast. Okay. So that's the chart <coughs> from their site. They're talking about a hundred times faster than memory use. Okay, it fits in memory. If all the data set can fit into a uh, memory, then it's hundred times faster. And even without that, they can still reach 10 times faster than regular metric use jobs. As I mentioned, because they don't need to take a, uh, kill the container, I mean, redo every step, okay, to, because they can quickly set up those stage for every step, right? Another reason is that Spark has the, another concept called transformation and action. So if you do a bunch of transformation, <coughs> actually Spark is not doing real work at that time. <coughs> okay, you can do a bunch of transformation together. So uh, basically it means you can you can you can aggregate all those things together. And finally you just we you when Spark sees that code to uh, action, then it just run it, okay? So instead of like MapReduce jobs, right? Every time you do a uh, MapReduce, basically reading data from HDFS, put back, put data back and do it again. Actually, they kill the previous process first, okay? And this one doesn't need to do that. That's why, that's another reason it's fast. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay, cool. So RDB, that's the main concept. Uh, resilient distributed data set represents immutable partition collection of documents, which can be uh, operated in parallel. So that's the main uh, Spark architecture. So they have a driver program, they have a cluster manager, and cluster manager manages those work nodes to see how many uh, executors they need to create for a particular uh, job. So executor basically it's a GPN. Okay. Cluster manager will dispatch those uh, code to uh, and data set to the uh, <coughs> then execute, execute uh, uh, run that. So uh, Spark component, there are a couple uh, Spark, main Spark components. One of them is the Spark streaming. So uh, how many people have used Spark streaming? Oh cool, good, that's good. So uh, basically you can, it's kind of mini batches in this case. So you can uh, specify 
how often you want to run that process, like uh, every five seconds, every two seconds, then you will get any changes from either file system sent to, to the process. If you are monitoring the directory, okay. Also, you can do uh, read data from Kafka. Kafka is the, uh, a distributed uh, path set system. Okay. Uh, Spark also support Spark SQL. It used to be, uh, they deprecated Shark. So now it's in favor of uh, Spark SQL. So you can write SQL to, to do those uh, experimentation, exploitation stuff. Can grab data from, from uh, like a JSON or anywhere. Actually, they create a new API called Data Frame API. So it's kind of a, like same concept as in R, Python. It's pretty nice. You can join those together. So another one is called MLF. So it's a machine learning package. I think it's getting better and better. Back to three, three years ago, when I first looked at it, it only have around like five algorithms, k-means, only a little bit. But now they, they have a lot more algorithms behind it. And graphics. So, so that's another machine learning package for graphing, uh, graph computing. So Spark streaming, uh, as I said, you can read data from Kafka, from HDFS, zero MQ, Twitter, <coughs> Twitter, because Twitter has the API, right? So you can read that one from from Twitter and do a streaming and process it, do some transformation, do some action, then save data back to HDFS or database or whatever. And I believe currently a lot of people start uh, saving data back to Attackium. So, so the later process can use what's in Attackium to keep, keep doing the process. Mm -hmm. If you, uh, so let's say there's, there are other options for the process speed, as long as you can get an API and do that integration. Yes, that's right. Still good at all. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, those are just some examples. There are lots of Sorry. other options. <coughs> Go ahead. So from like Kafka, you mean like it? It can be a live Kafka consumer, like as much as they come in in real time. Yes, exactly. Yes. There's a good chart response. You can also uh, <coughs> just query existing Kafka messages. You can point it to, you know, if you have persist messages, then you can run. Yeah. But, <coughs> yeah, I think so. You can still grab it. <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And do a streaming, actually, you can grab data from somewhere else as well, from database or whatever. Through GDC, from MongoDB, Cassandra, and all that. Then you can combine those things together and process it. <coughs> so, it, yeah, it doesn't limit it to, to that data set. Okay. So, because I'm from IT, typically I'm kind of interested in putting some code here, you know. <laughs> so, like running local Spark job, it's kind of easy. Just set up a uh, master, so local, okay. And running Spark job in a cluster, that's kind of easy too. So, basically, you just use the uh, Spark master URL and specify the uh, jar file so it can push uh, the jar file to the cluster and run it from there. And you can do unit testing as well. Probably not very interesting <laughs> stuff, but you go back it's still cool. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's from uh, Suite. 
So basically, you can have a before and after to print that up, uh, spark context. Then we start to stop it. Okay. Doesn't have to be replacement. Mm -hmm. But before, after. So yeah. when you write this. Yeah. So before, here, basically, you set up that. Uh, create that spark context. <coughs> That's the only thing you need. Oh. Then you write your test. Also. Yeah, before then you test that. Exactly. exactly. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. Exactly. So that's a streaming example. So this one I said to uh, uh, two seconds. Every two seconds, I will look at that uh, file or directory, stuff like that. So it's kind of nice if you know uh, all the changes go to uh, HDFS uh, anywhere in a certain directory. Then you can then you can just say text file stream. Then it will look for any changes inside that file and look at any uh, new files coming up, things like that. It will pick that up. So, so okay. you just, just back here there, the, the argument is that a lambda function that's concatenated. Uh, which one? Lambda? Oh, this? Yeah, the, the argument of the reduce back here. Oh, reduce? This one? It's from a uh, uh, star. Yeah, I know that, but the argument is that the uh, lambda function that's concatenating the... Oh, yeah, yeah, in paper, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I believe in Python, I use a lambda, yeah. And this one basically is doing a count, right? And it's classical. Uh, it support structured data and relational queries. So you can write SQL. Pretty much, uh, uh, you can read data from JSON and just specify the hierarchy and it will find the data you want. That's one way to do it. And if you want to access Hive, actually you can do that too. So it support Hive forever. It's just using a different uh, SQL container. <coughs> Okay, so here's the Spark SQL example. It's kind of pretty, pretty easy to understand as well. The only thing new is the SQL context. So basically, create SQL context using a uh, Spark context. Then you can read. Uh, <coughs> see here, basically, it's uh, reading uh, uh, data from. Uh, HDFS in JSON format. Actually, this is the Spark 1.2. In 1.3, 1.4, the syntax changed a little bit. Basically, uh, SQL context dot read dot JSON, that's it. Because they introduced the data frame API. Okay. And <coughs> you guys see uh, in here, select. That's a child inside that. So you can specify how I need to find any element you want within that JSON through that format. And support the staying of that. Any questions in here? Okay. Uh, yeah, this is basically how dynamically you can you can do it. Uh, just pre specify a schema if, if you're not using JSON. Because for JSON, Spark can automatically figure out the schema itself. <coughs> okay. And here, it's another way to specify. So if you use a piece class in Scala, then it will do a refraction to find out schema. Okay. Yeah, again, syntax change a little bit. In here, typically, when you before you register the table, you need to do, to do a, a two DF <coughs> data frame. Okay, so uh, that's a data frame API. Basically, uh, data frame is the distributed collection 
of the data organized into uh, unnamed columns. So you can specify you can specify uh, the column name, then graph that out. So you know, same thing. Just the uh, in R, can graph data out of it. So ML Lab is the machine learning library. Okay, and now it's it support a classification, class group, uh, FP, uh, frequent item mining, things like that. And it's getting better and better. And there are a bunch of things they're trying to add into, even in deep learning space. So, uh, they're trying to do a uh, restrict old spam machine, just like that. Uh, it's pretty nice. <coughs> I think eventually this one might, might gain momentum over a uh, house, just like that. I'll mention that one a lot more. So classification, collaborative, filtering, currently they only support ALS. Uh, they don't support item similarity stuff yet, item based recommendation yet. But in Mahal, in Mahal they already have that. Uh, they already have an algorithm for Spark in Mahal. So, uh, any guy, anyone knows Mahal? Wow. Cool. That's good, yeah. Yeah, hopefully Mahal won't go away. Yeah, <laughs> because so there's so many algorithms. Yeah, that's right. So, and lots of people are trying. To, oh, sorry. Okay. Lots of people are trying to add new algorithms. Currently, only in Mahal. Yeah. Back to ML lab. So mm -hmm. I kind of worry about Mahal <coughs> a little bit. So the business case for uh, over the stock was to uh, engine recommendation. So do they plan to? How to Spark or? That's a great question. So, but how already have a version to support Spark for that? It actually <coughs> now so they're not doing what they do. That's right. It's exactly. All Spark. Yep. But the problem is that lots of people probably just add that piece of code in ML Lab directly instead of going through a how. You know, and how is trying to go couple directions. One is integrate with the uh, Spark, right? Writing new algorithm uh, for Spark. There's another thing they're doing is adding uh, integration to uh, H2O. H2O is the R package, natively. Okay. But I think they're doing quite well these days. They have a pretty nice UI on top of it, and they support deep learning and stuff like that which these three packages don't have those algorithms yet. I'll mention a little bit more later, probably in the next slide. So yeah, as I mentioned, frequent pattern mining, they already have that. This one already, yeah, but how old also have this algorithm? So that's what I'm talking about, so H2O. So it's a uh, package, and they have a lot of reasons, PDs, all that, classification stuff. Compared to Mahal, though, they don't have a lot of uh, reasons in H12, but they have a pretty nice UI on top of it. Okay, And H12 has uh, a bunch of uh, deep learning stuff. So DL4J. That's another open source package. It's uh, for deep learning for, J, for Java. Okay. Have you used it? Yeah. Uh, Would you keep using it? Uh, I wish I can spend more time in that one. So I kind of excited about getting back to a deep learning again. You know, back to ten years ago, fifteen years ago, everyone thought that, right? Mm -hmm. Neural networks. Who cares? It's too slow, right? But these days, we're getting back. Okay, so yeah, convolutional networks, 
our neural networks, multi-layer neural networks, they are coming back these days. So, but how that's another <coughs> one, yeah, they start create, uh, creating new algorithms with memory views. Okay. <coughs> so, if you want to write a new algorithm, then you cannot just do do that on top of memory views. So that could be a uh, spark. Do you want to use this kernel or like Java? Uh, actually, you can do either way. So, uh, so mainly, uh, Mahal is the Java package, but they do add some uh, Scala code into into their code as well. So, yeah. So they support those. So OREX, that's another one. Oh, another reason why why I worry about the how is the OREX is it's, it's created by uh, Sean Over. Okay, he's the committer to Mahal. Then he dropped out. He don't do Mahal anymore. Now he's working for uh, Cloudera. Okay. So that's mainly a recommendation system in here, and it's using ALS mainly. So it's a real-time ALS. So GraphLab, that's another one. It's reading in C++. And they support recommendation stuff. And another thing I kind of interested in Spark is that uh, Spark has another Code line, not not necessarily code line. Basically, they have a Spark ML pipeline API. They put into another package, okay, and basically they're trying to support uh, combining those algorithms together. So that's kind of nice because we cannot just use one algorithm typically. Typically, we need to uh, combine those algorithms. Yeah. yeah, there are a lot of others, you know. So classification, that's one example. Uh, so naive bands, so you just do a training, then you can do a predict, okay? This one is the user in TF IDF as a feature. So k means it's kind of easy, right? Everyone probably can do that. It means not training. Then, then take the vectors, feature vectors. Then you specify how many I mean, number of clusters into it. Then specify number of iterations. So it's kind of pretty nice, right? But for now, our uh, uh, Spark ML Lab doesn't support Navi yet. So and Mahal has it. They're trying to add NLP into it. So basically find out how many how many uh, clusters they should have, right? So typically when we do uh, k mm -hmm. we do a pre-processing using a NLP to find out how many, because number of clusters actually matters a lot. That's kind of key as well. So TF idea. Term frequency uh, inverse document frequency. It's used pretty often by search engine, right? To find out how many words inside that document, inside that, you know. So it's kind of easy. Just do a hashing. Graphics. So it's an API for uh, graph processing. For example, if you want to calculate page rank. You can do that through this. It's kind of a great example for doing graph computing. And a couple of things I want to mention is that there's the, there are a bunch of interactive clients available these days. So it's pretty easy for you guys to, to try it out. And it will give your data right, uh, if the result right away. So I found that one example soon to be uh, Jupyter. After uh, I found 3.0, then 
it's going to be called uh, Jupyter. They have a pretty nice UI and lots of people develop lots of modules behind it to support uh, multiple, uh, a lot of different languages, Pascal, all that, Scala. <coughs> so they call it kernels. So like an iScala, that's a kernel behind it to support Scala. iSpark to support uh, Spark. Spark kernel, that's another one. And in the same space, there's the Scala notebook. <clears throat> so it's kind of similar, but different UI, okay. Yeah, that basically it's a baseline I found from my wife. <clears throat> then they changed the GUI inside Scala notebook. <clears throat> so another variation is called a Spark notebook. It's on top of Scala notebook. So Zeppelin, that's another one. So it's another open uh, Apache open source project. And in my demo, I will. I will show you how it looks, how easy you can build chart, you can change your chart, stuff like that. Uh, Beaker notebook, that's another one. This support, uh, yeah, multiple languages, scholarly. Scholarly is one thing, but they don't support Spark directly. Okay, so now I need to do a little demo on the iPad phone and uh, zip it. Let's do the IPython first. So it's kind of nice. In here, uh, so I have two notebooks here. One of them called basic, another one called Pi Spark. Because I uh, Spark support Python, it's called Pi Spark. And you can just run the, you can just run the, uh, Python job there. Oops. I need a so in here, that's the code. In IPython, you can just write a uh, Python code like this, just to run it through those. Then I show you the result, the result right away. So those are, that's a, a Spark SQL example. Just select, uh, select data from these columns from that AD test and group by on that <clears throat> because I print schema, so that's what it looks like. So in that table, it has culture ID, GMS, invoice ID, things like that. Those are columns. Okay. So this part is running the scale load on your local machine here? No, actually, it's against. Uh, my office machine, but I didn't set up. Yeah. Before I come, before I came here, I run it. So I wish I could set up that one. <clears throat> yeah. So that's another example. Parallel, basically you can fix some data in there. 
do a track map, then print out the results. So, so in here, <coughs> go ahead. Sorry. For parallel lines, don't usually you have to pass the how many partitions you want? Like, what's the default? Oh, for the k-means, yes. Yep. For k-means, you have to specify that. So, yeah, that's kind of the same thing in pandas. So you can run pandas, you can run Spark, and all of that, right? And this one is kind of pretty nice. I found you can print out all those formula stuff. You can put a bunch of notes in that notebook. So, so you're trying to share these, then everyone knows what it does, right? So that's kind of nice. That makes sense, guys? So, yeah, natively it's just support Python, but you can have other <coughs> modules available to support Scala, to support uh, uh, Spark directly. So are each of these separate, each of these kind of text boxes that you've got in there, are those separate jobs? No. Okay. Does the context share between them? Yes. So you can run start from, from start to to end, mm. from beginning to end, and yeah, it's using the same, same Spark context. Then you can grab data out of it directly. Okay. Initially, it will take a little bit of time to initialize Spark context. Go ahead. If you were to program a Spark using only Python and no Scala, what mm -hmm. limitations would you run into? What, what are the cons of that? So you can do almost everything. Almost. Yeah. PySpark. What's the PySpark? So one limitation we run into using PySpark is that it doesn't support the cluster code. Oh. It's the same way Scala does. So you actually have to copy your Python files to the oh, I see. Uh -huh. code and the cluster where you can actually use it. Mm -hmm. But it's actually not a big deal. It's like one pretty easy, it's not a big deal. Yeah. It's, it's very minor limitation. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think they've gotten better. Right, it used to be that Python was more of a set of classes, and, and now it's, yeah. Yeah, it's getting better and better. Now it even for R, right? Yeah, Spark R. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if Amazon actually added support for Spark as well, mm -hmm. in our particular case, we just have an S3 drive. Mm -hmm. We can our files to, and we just spin up a Spark cluster on demand, and do process when we need yep. to sell. That's and good. It's just it's really pretty slick. Yep. Um, so it takes about yeah, 15 or 20 minutes, and that's pretty much independent of however many notes you create. Um, but we actually have a small cluster running all the time for doing tests, mm -hmm. prototyping that sort of thing. Yep. So fire off the big boy. Have you guys done any testing on like, we're using PMR and standalone? Have you run Spark on PMR yet? Yeah. And is that what you do, or do you yeah. do? Uh, I wonder how much overhead is, what the performance ramifications are. We're just going to start looking at that week. Right uh, now, it's all the EMR stuff. I haven't noticed anything. So they just barely have to put a month ago. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually exploring that right now. And that's where I, I've got a cluster full of right now. Yeah. No, that's what we're using too. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Also, Databricks, the uh, commercial company behind Spark. They created a cloud, cloud solution. Basically, they add uh, like a management stuff into it. So you can manage a uh, Spark cluster inside, inside their uh, uh, cloud platform. And the interface is very much like the next one I'm going to show you. Okay. So that's a part iPad dump. Okay. <clears throat> Another one I'm going to show you is Zipring. It's from Apache. I think recently they just moved to Apache project. That's the Apache project. Okay, so that's what Zipring looks like. Okay, it's not 
as rich as the IPython in terms of uh, interpreter and stuff. So they, for example, uh, they support uh, Markdown and stuff like that, but they don't have uh, formula and stuff. I haven't figured out how to do that. And probably they cannot load those images directly from any anywhere, things like that. But but they do have pretty good spot integration. Okay. So so in here, naive bands, you just put those code here and just run it. Specify uh, you can train it. Can do a filter, calculate accuracy for your test set, things like that. I'm not sure if I have a good example for I should have saved that. So that's the data frame API. I'm going to show you a little bit. So basically, you can read. Yeah, that's a new format. Uh, SQL <coughs> dot read dot JSON. It will read the JSON, and it create a data frame. And when you show it, just say dot show. It shows the data right away. Then you can print out schema. Then you can even do uh, select, select a certain field, things like that. You can do a filter, you can do a group by, you can do a join, things like that. So you can you can do either way. Either use a SQL to do a group by, or you can just uh, uh, make a call to a data frame object. Okay. Sorry, I cannot show you guys the charts, stuff like that yet. I have to connect to the, my office machine in order to do that. If you guys have a couple minutes, then I'll do that later. Okay, go ahead. Do you um, do you see any performance differences between running in SQL versus Python versus Scala or any of the different? You know, do they all interpret down to the same thing, or do they have differences? That's a great question. I Personally, I don't notice the difference. If you you can look at a log, and underneath, I believe it's running the same thing. So PySpark uses Hyper J. I'm not familiar with that. So the interop layer actually just operates on Java directly. Mm -hmm. so yep. There's I've never noticed any performance significant performance. Don't know. Yep. Is Hyper J the new Python? No, no, it's not. When it, it, it's actually, it actually creates a Java virtual machine, and it talks across the side of the thing that Python processes oh. Java virtual So it's still C Python and uh, Java. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So a couple of things in Zipring, but I cannot show you yet. Is that once you do. Uh, uh, run SQL, like uh, select something from, uh, you can do a group by stuff, then it will build chart directly. You can pick a, a different pie chart or that. And you can share the result with anyone. Basically, it's just a, a URL you can send to anyone. They will see that. Uh, they will see the same result as you. But once you change the code, if a chart is changing, they will see that result right away as well. So I believe this one is a build on top of uh, Android JS. Okay. Where so do you know what chart is it use like DS or I think it's D3. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. The chart itself is pretty beautiful. And it's interactive as well. Once you move to those P's, it will show you the data. So these three can do that, yes. Questions? Okay. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, 
Okay, here's some references. Uh, those links are from the uh, internet. You guys can find it. So, any questions? Could you switch back to references? That oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, like programming guide, SQL programming, ML lab, and ML guide, things like that. So, it's kind of very interesting. The last one is kind of pretty exciting is that you can uh, combine this algorithm together. You can do a transformation of those data and stuff like that. It's kind of pretty nice. And it's, those code are living in the new package. It's not ML lab, it's called Spark.ml. So, and our reason still stay in ML lab. But this one, I kind of excited about it. Okay. So for the streaming part, um, how they plan to use that uh, <coughs> the, the streaming part is part. Mm -hmm. How they want to use it is the other stuff. Uh, it's free. But are you, are you plan on using Spark string uh, over stuff? Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, we're using uh, request log stuff. So currently we're putting to HDFS. At the meantime, we're writing to edge base. So a uh, couple ideas. One is read it from JSON directly. So we also have a Kafka. So we are still trying to decide which one we're trying to use. We're trying to grab the uh, uh, data from, but we have all the sources. That makes sense? Yeah. So the users are we don't use any yeah. other tool. That's right, that's right. So the main uh, use cases is the uh, recommendation. We're using that one, uh, request log, main to generate recommendations. We're using for using that piece of information for search uh, as well. I mean, to basically using uh, customer feedback to influence the search result. So you make your precision they follow with it? I do. Yeah, it's kind of very nice to be able to use customer feedback to push up, push down products, to push up, push down the refinements stuff, if you guys are familiar with that. So, go ahead. I was wondering if you could talk more about use cases for machine learning and maybe to share any successes or you know, bottom line impacts or like. You know. uh, yeah, I, so I mainly, <clears throat> my team, they, they mainly do it for the innovation side. Also, uh, I kind of doing those research for uh, new packages, things like that. No, I mainly uh, IT background, you know, so I'm kind of mainly interested in those things. So for the collaborative filtering, for the recommendation, did you send out an email, or do you do it like Amazon does? It? So you're on the product, we do you say these are the yeah. So, so we do have <coughs> kinds of recommendations available these days. We do uh, final recommendations for. Uh, like file view and for purchase. If we purchase these, we'll show you this recommendation. Someone who purchased these also purchased that. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Right. Successes? I mean, does it work? Yes, it does. So, yeah, that's a great question. Actually, we were able to uh, to kill the party recommendation systems with uh, the system we did three years ago. So save a couple of minutes there. Yeah. What about how, how much does it drive up your sales? Yeah. Anything like around that? Uh, it's about like two percent, seems like that against other systems. What do you mean against the other systems? So in terms of revenue, we do a passing for all the two percent better than the yeah. primary system. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right. And we don't need to spend that much money. Right. And the price keeps going up. That's another thing, right? <laughs> Go ahead. Do you have an idea how rich the set of uh, functions in graphics is compared to, say, Python's Network X or R's uh, iGraph? Ah. Uh, GraphX, <coughs> you're talking about? Yeah, do you know how many, say, how many algorithms exist in GraphX compared to some of those other <coughs> packages that exist? Actually, I, we are not using GraphX a lot yet. It all depends on the uh, project, right? So. 
see what kind of area we're trying to use. For now, we're not using GraphX yet. I wish I could. If there's a new project, I would be very happy about it. Go ahead. Um, do you guys do any kind of sentiment analysis based on customer reviews? Um, if you use machine learning for that, what kind of algorithms would you would use for that? That's that's a good question. Um, where there's another group of team of doing something like that. They do uh, social and all of that. Sorry, I wish I can do a lot more with these the tools we have now. You know, so getting better and better. I wish I can get into those things. More exciting stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I was just going to ask, do you give different um, recommendations based on if people are on a mobile device, like a cell phone or a tablet? That's a good question. Yes, we do. Or something. Yes. Yep. Yeah, we are able to capture all these. <clears throat> so we can generate uh, device through the recommendation. And another thing we do is that we do send our email recommendations. Uh, on the email as well. So I don't know if you ever need to gather like location and give different uh, recommendations based on where people like their. Um, we do capture those kind of information, but as far as I know, we don't do that yet. But yeah, we do have a bunch of algorithms. We are consistently maybe testing it to find out which one performs better. So, yep, at some point, I wish we can use all that information, right? And hopefully, the result would be a lot better. So, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, go ahead. Yes, in terms of spot streaming and uh, the regular spot, mm -hmm. I, if the data is actually static, mm -hmm. it's not like being fed from the Live, mm -hmm. is it uh, still good to use spot streaming or just regular spot? I would think probably <coughs> just regular spot. Yeah, yeah. If uh, there's no data change, so spot streaming so, is just for. Okay. So typically, if we want to do uh, incremental changes uh, as quickly as possible, then we want to do a spot streaming because we want to use the new source of data to influence what we have now, right? To change the model, to update the model, things like that. Have you been following Yahoo at all? Last year they did a whole, I got, I've done a few years with the storm, mm -hmm. and I know Yahoo has a really large storm cluster on yeah. the yard, mm -hmm. and uh, they've been working on trying to replace storm with spark, mm -hmm. and they go down and report on it, to. Oh. How does it look? Probably not. Right? It's <laughs> looking a lot better than it did in September. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it like might be some bounds from where it was less than a year ago. Yeah. Yep. Like if spot is getting better and better, but yes. they still have some issues before, right? Before they have the integration with the young things like that. Multi time issue, you know, job schedule, stuff. So, so more it's getting better around. Yeah. <coughs> how far am I in the file? Mm -hmm. yeah. I was wondering if you talk about the size of your data set. And uh, then, uh, kind of along those lines, it seems kind of like, do you ever really, like, is the data really in memory ever for Spark? It seems like if you're working with such a big data set, it seems kind of crazy to expect That's it to be in memory. Actually, all our data wasn't that big. Oh, yeah. How big is not that big? So we have, like daily, we have a couple hundred gig yeah. for request log. And we have something else as well. But, you know, for now, it's not that. Things are huge. Can you find the tunes to put that in a core off? Yeah. And they have a fully deep memory inside each or something like that. Yeah, it's not as big as Yahoo or Google. <laughs> well, it never. Is. Yeah, it's a, yeah, Yahoo is kind of interesting. They have their own 
everything. So no, that's a non package. It was good. Yeah. So I work in Yahoo, and they don't think of themselves as search Never did. Never <laughs> thinking. They still do search. You can still search on Yahoo. No, but they never thought of themselves as a search. Right, like all the engineers are like, your search, you're the search company, right? They do concerts now, a lot of live streaming concerts now. Right. I think Mozilla is sitting in the yeah, well, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is that they don't identify. Yahoo doesn't identify themselves as a search engine. Like Google does not say. Like Google said, we're in the search And Yahoo said, Google, you want to do search for us? Cool. We're not a search engine. Okay. Good. Yeah. Any more questions? Anything? Anything? Any concerns? Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I forgot to mention we have the new function we're doing tomorrow. So watch the video for that. And then we have to make it in the house. Don't forget Spark Day on Saturday. Um, Four or five. Yeah, I'm thinking about connecting to my. Are you guys doing the same login? Uh, so I just need to log into uh, my. Uh, computer. Yeah, I'm just logging into my computer.